Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. I need a better intro. I need a better intro. I really do. But anyway, without further ado, let's get straight on to the news. Now we know that the coronavirus is trying to wipe out the whole of humanity. It is the one thing on everybody's lips at the minute. Well, not everybody's. More pressing issues. Issues that I'm surprised haven't been on the BBC right now. And that is Clampgate. Yeah, you heard me right. Clampgate. Now you might have seen yesterday's video where I went on a two day bike maintenance course, stripped down my bike, rebuilt my bike with two highly skilled professional mechanics. These are the men you go to to get your qualifications here in the UK, right? Maybe not the only place, but one of the only places. I highly recommend it. If you want to take your first steps into the, the, the industry here in the UK, these are the people, I said it in the video, these are the people that you will probably go and see to get your qualifications. So it's fair to say, they know what they're talking about. But according to some of you, they don't. Let's just take a look at a few of the comments. First up is Drew, and Drew, appreciate all your comments. All right, appreciate all your support for the channel. However, you two are making me cringe clamping that repair stand on your frame. Seat post, clamp the seat post. Easily replaceable if you ham-fistedly crush a tube. This one here is Jason Dorset Mammal Cycling. Now the fact that he's wrote Mammal Cycling on his YouTube username says to me, this guy definitely knows what he's talking about. All right, potentially more highly skilled and more highly qualified than the mechanics that I saw up there. WTF! Carbon frames go super thin in the midsection of the seat tube. So thin in fact, that clamp on front mech should never be tightened above 2.5 Newton meters. That could be correct. I'm not bothered. So why the hell has no one who works there slapped the f out of you guys for clamping your carbon frames? You want to watch yourself, son. Seat posts are designed to be clamped by their very nature. Even seat tubes have to be beefed up around the clamping areas to support the clamps or wedges used to secure the seat post. Confused emoji. I don't appreciate that tone, Jason. But anyway, that's by the by. But what I will say is the first conversation we had with John and Dave, highly skilled, highly trained mechanics, was to never ever, 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 ever clamp your frame by the top tube. That is in fact the thinnest part of the frame, the weakest part of the frame, and where the least amount of carbon is used. And if you ham-fistedly, like Drew would say, clamped it down too hard, you could potentially crack the frame, right? That's what they said. I listened. So our next question was, well, where do we bloody clamp it then? Because I've been clamping my top tube. Don't tell anybody. All right, I don't really care. But I said to them, where should we clamp it? And they said, on the frame's seat tube. Not the seat post. You can do it on the seat post, but the seat tube is one of the strongest parts of the frame. And don't be an idiot when you're clamping it down. Don't over tighten it, you don't need to. Which is pretty much common sense, all right? So, if you wanna go and have that argument, feel free to get in contact with them. Don't leave your comments down below, cause I don't care, all right? Anyway, hopefully that has cleared that up. And uh, yeah, you can, you can stop leaving your messages. I mean, feel free, when you do leave your comments like that, just, just leave down in the comments as well, your kind of your qualification, all right? So we know, that this isn't just coming from someone who has seen a GCM video once and they said don't do it. Because who are you going to listen to? An anonymous person in the comments or a highly skilled bike mechanic? I know. Anyway, well, let's get on with the rest of the news. And sticking with internet news actually, if you are a, a Canyon owner, I highly recommend you don't go and watch Hambini's latest video on Canyon Frames. Right, so as is normal, I have to think of a correct title for my presentations. So on to, for today's presentation, I've decided to call it Canyon Bicycle Engineering is Dragged to a New Low, I'd Rather Shit in My Hands and Then Clap. Yeah, I mean, if you want to go and see it, the link is down in the description, however, it's tough watching if you are involved in Canyon anyway or you have a Canyon bike. And I think from that, I'll probably steer away from them. 
but then again, I'm on a Trigon, aren't I? And I, I tried to think what I'd say if he got hold of my bike. <laughs> also, in Tinter's net news, we covered this story a couple of times. Um, Phil Guyman, the YouTuber, ex-professional cyclist, fell off his bike on his way to trying to chase an Olympic dream, to trying to make the Olympic team in 2020 in the team pursuit in, for, for Team USA. He had a crash, suffered some serious injuries, broken ribs, broken scapula, all sorts of punctured lung, all sorts of different injuries, abrasions. So I wasn't gonna talk about this. Cycling News picked up the story of me being a quarter million dollars in health debt, uh, and then other media picked it up. The thing is, I want to pay the doctors who took care of me. Like, I want them to be compensated, I want them to be happy. They deserve it, they fix me up real nice. The hospital gives these crazy sticker prices to, to people like you and me, and then the health insurance negotiates that down. He's just dropped a video explaining all about his medical bills, his current situation, his financial situation behind how he's going to try and pay those bills. It's just, it's horrible to see and hear that this is even a thing. Like, he's paying $500 a month in medical insurance and it won't cover him for this. That is insane. And then talking of medical bills, talking of people crashing their bikes, this was posted on Twitter two days ago by Right to Bike. And if you are a little squeamish, if you're a little bit of a nervous disposition, I suggest you don't watch this because it was hard watching. Sorry, boy. Look, camera, camera, you fucking dickhead. Now I know these incidents are probably few and far between for the amount of cyclists that are actually out there cycling and these incidents that happen, they're probably few and far between, but they're, it happens once, it's too often, right? And this is why I think that bikes should now be integrated with cameras. Because had those cameras not been on his bike, it would have gone unnoticed. These people wouldn't have been prosecuted or potentially prosecuted. Even if one person watches this and goes, ooh, that's a little bit close and then jumps in their car and notices a cyclist and goes, Bloody hell, I don't want to be that person that nearly knocks that person off. So I'm going to give him a wide berth. I'm that cyclist, I'll give him a wide berth. And then all of a sudden, you've developed this, this habit of giving cyclists wide berths. It's not difficult. It is not difficult. Just leave your ego at home. Whenever you get into the car, it's going to reduce the risk of accidents happening. No destination is worth the risk to somebody's life. Like take that first one, for instance. You can see the guy having to move out into the middle of the road after about four seconds to avoid some potholes, right? Had what happened to him two seconds, three seconds later happened then, he's a goner. He's getting taken out by that car. He's getting crushed under that car and he's dead. And if he's not dead, he's bloody seriously injured. <sighs> All right, plenty of racing news to talk about. First up, the World Track Championships have started in Berlin and they have started with a bloody bang. The first medal up for grabs in the Track Championships was the Women's 10K Scratch Final and it was won by Christine Wild. And what a bloody performance it was. In fact, she spoke exclusively to the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show earlier. So the race for me was, uh, was very simple, very easy. A uh, bit difficult uh, from, from around lap 10. I found myself at the back of the, 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 the group and had to fight over the top to, uh, to get to the front. But once it was there, it was pretty simple. Just sat there and, uh, and opened the gash and no one could uh, obviously come around me. 
I saw Laura Kenny, she went backwards and uh, yeah, bodes well for the Olympics, no? And then after that, the German women took the team sprint title and then the men's team sprint was, was a cracking performance from Team GB. They set some fast world-class times. Only good enough for second on this case because the Dutch again took victory. Yeah, so uh, what of it? We, we, we won and uh, we shared a brand new world record. So that's uh, it's very inspiring, very positive as we head to, uh, to Tokyo. I'll be honest, I don't think uh, GB or I don't think anybody will get close to us as we uh, we take that gold medal in Tokyo. I think uh, they're all screwed now. Uh, Chris, just want to say real quick, uh, bloody love your channel. Subscribe to it. Hit that notification bell so I know when you go live. And I've got to say, it's, uh, it's the best channel on the internet, no? Thank you, Phil. I think for the first time ever coming into the Olympics, Team GB aren't going to be the favourites. Everybody's going to be looking at the Dutch and saying they're the strongest nation. They've just wiped the floor with everybody in the World Championships because, trust me, they are. Definitely the most entertaining race of the night was the Team Pursuit. The Team Pursuit, like, whichever way you cut it, I think who bought bike guys have a lot to answer for in making this one of the most entertaining... It's always been entertaining, don't get me wrong. But what's happening now in Team Pursuit is amazing. We saw five teams all go under the magic three minute 50 barrier. At one point in time, we never thought we'd see anybody going under three minutes and 50. Unbelievable, the Danes were the fastest, three minutes and 46 seconds. GB could only qualify in seventh, which meant the best result that they can get out of this now is a bronze medal. So after the qualifying was the first round of heats. So in the first two heats, GB were the fastest in the first, beating Germany and Australia were the fastest in the second, beating Switzerland. Now, this is how far it seems that the team pursuit has come because all of a sudden, and I've never seen this, well, I've seen it once or twice, but it rarely happens when the man in third position, once one rider has dropped off the back, the man in third position actually ends up getting dropped themselves. We saw it with Germany, who were well ahead of GB at the time, and had he not got dropped, it would have been a different story. We saw it with the French as well. They ended up just doing three individual pursuits rather than a team pursuit. And such is the speed and effort that's needed now to go quickly in the team pursuit. The riders need to be on it so much in that one little error in changing or just not getting the power down or just getting a bit too close and easing off a tiny bit but easing off too much and then all of a sudden going out the back is so minute now. And again, I think that has a lot to do with how the team pursuits developed since Who What Bike came in and kind of shook up the whole system, changed the way riders are changing, changed the way in which riders are doing turns and for how long they're doing turns. And it just it's just created this huge, exciting event. And I think, come Tokyo, the team pursuit is definitely going to be the race to watch in the velodrome. And then just to touch on those last two heats of the first round, the Danes set a brand new world record Again, 3 minutes, 46 seconds, 0 0.203. And they're going to be facing New Zealand, who set a time in that last heat of 3 minutes and 47. Like I say, the Danes have probably got this one wrapped up, even if they don't go at world record pace. But it depends how they've recovered. By the time this comes out, I guess we'll already know who's won that. But it is going to be an enthralling race, that one. And I beg, make sure you watch it. And while we're on the subject of track racing and British cycling and Team GB, you've probably heard the news already that HSBC has activated a break clause in their contract to bring their sponsorship of British cycling to an end after Tokyo. It came as a shock to a lot of people, I think, that this is happening. They should have had an eight-year deal with British cycling, but they're cancelling it after only four. And how that's going to play out over the next couple of years, I don't know. HSBC Worldwide have just cut 35,000 jobs and they're trying to save by 2022 $4.5 billion. HSBC are claiming that they're rescinding their sponsorship of British Cycling because of budget constraints. They're trying to save more and more money because of, of lower profits in the past couple of years. But has it got something to do potentially with all the the negativity that's surrounding British cycling at the minute. You've got the Dr. Freeman Tribunal going off at the minute. Still got that bitter taste in your mouth from British cycling after the way they treat Jess Varnish. Is this, the, is this going to be the end of, of British cycling? Is this going to be the end of cycling here in the UK? Everything seems to kind of be going in the wrong direction at the minute. We had the massive peak back in 2012 and now we've got what seems to be potentially the dark ages again. 
We've got very little racing going off here in the UK, very little support for it from British Cycling here in the UK. You've just had sponsorship withdrawn from British Cycling. So that again, that's not going to help with race organisation and grassroots cycling. Then <laughs> you've got this tweet. Now, I don't know if this was a joke, but you've got this tweet from Jason Kenny one day prior to the World Championships. We've just been issued our World Championship kit for the week. One skin suit. <laughs> Hoping for marginal stains. Now, I don't know if this is a bit of a joke from Jason or if it's just a bit of a hark back to the olden days. I say olden days, probably 10, 15, maybe, yeah, 10 or 15 years, no, 15, 20 years ago. Before all the lottery funding came, when a rider went to the World Championships or the Olympics, they'd be issued their kit and then at the end of the World Championships, they'd have that kit taken back off them. Such was the, uh, the lack of budget. For, for riders so is this just a heart back to that just a little nod and a laugh to, to to the other riders or has he only been issued one skin suit now one thing i did notice with a lot of the riders skin suits last night there was a lot of experimental materials being used um, as you saw on the new zealand team sprint riders i don't know what kind of plastic or what kind of material it was used on the forearms of of ethan mitchell's suit the women's Chinese team sprint suit also look very sheeny, very plasticky. So, so teams are obviously using this as a bit of a test for some materials prior to the Olympics. Now, is this suit that Jason's got a very, very high-tech suit? It doesn't look like your run-of-the-mill skin suits. You can see a little bit of ribbon there on the on the arms. But is it is it something special to try that they want to get ready for the Olympics? Or literally, HSBC withdraw sponsorship or announce withdrawing of sponsorship and then the budgets get cut back and riders only get one skin suit yeah to be fair jason is only using it for 45 seconds probably like five minutes maximum throughout the whole world championships but leave your comments down below how do you think hsbc's withdrawal of sponsorship is going to affect british cycling should we be prepared for some dark times here in the uk has the bubble burst or do you think if we can go to rio and come back with like a haul of gold medals that that's really going to inspire everybody and, and put cycling back on top as one of the mainstream sports here in the UK and people are going to want to pump money back into it. Potentially it could be a good thing for British cycling if HSBC pull their funding then a big company comes in and just say yeah we want to be part of this we want to be the face of this boom there's billions. I don't know but it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on it. Leave them down below. And I think that's about it for today's show. Make sure you leave your comments down below on everything that I've talked about. Not mechanicking, all right? And also, I've already bled my brakes for those of you that were commenting on it. Nailed it. You'll see that video short. I mean, listen, before you see that video, it's not a how-to video, all right? It's, it's a, can an amateur mechanic actually bleed brakes? Is it a simple job for an amateur? Turns out it pretty much is. Thanks for watching everybody. Make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. I want to get to 15,000 subs. Come on. Stop fannying about. Just hit it. Even if you don't hit that notification bell. All right, feed my ego, please. Thanks. See you next time, bye.